that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. Then the gui magua na kathulu relia wagla na den fatega, for the gui magua na fen kathulu relia wagla na den fatega. Hello there. My name is Michael, and let's talk about Howard Phillips Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft is probably the most defining figure in horror in the entire 20th century, at least for the United States, but maybe for the world, and he's one of the rare horror authors that really hasn't aged with time. I mean, you can go back and look at, say, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or Bram Stoker's Dracula, and you could feel like it was much more specifically of its era, and you can see things from the early 19th century and late 19th century, respectively, from those two works that really um, didn't translate perfectly well to modernity. But H.P. Lovecraft had the opposite issue. He was not very uh, reflective, necessarily, of the fears and terrors of his own time, and he actually has grown in over the past century into fame and glory in the horror world, and virtually everyone that is anybody in the horror world, and even outside of it, people like Neil Gaiman, Stephen King, who are major, major figures in the writing world over the past 30 years, are in love with Lovecraft in many ways and recognize his greatness. Now, uh, Lovecraft was a peculiar figure. He did not attend college and did not have anything approaching a normal job his entire life. He was extremely introverted, painfully shy, uh, terrified about other people and his own appearance, and he was convinced of his own monstrousness. And there are a number of moments in his work where you can see he's clearly talking about himself uh, as a person who is bizarre, twisted, strange, obsessed with the occult, like Charles Ward in the case of Charles Dexter Ward, or uh, some sort of monstrous ghoul uh, in the audiobook I recorded, which I'm going to link above. That's, that's clearly H.P. Uh, Lovecraft talking about himself in that story, some sort of creature that stayed isolated or cocooned in a place far away from other people, and when he tried to reveal himself, he thought of himself as being nightmarish or evil or some sort of hideous zombie. He was born in the early 20th century and did not live very long. He died in the mid-1930s uh, of cancer, and during his lifetime, his short stories and novels were never really achieved anything approaching real fame. There were a tiny number of people, especially other authors, who were very fond of him and his work. Um, however, the broader public uh, never really warmed to him during his lifetime. That was something that would happen gradually in the second half of the 20th century. His works uh, uniformly have a concept that's referred to as cosmic horror, which essentially he invented, of taking the nightmarish dread of human beings recognizing their own worthless insignificance in the greater galaxy, which of course we can connect there to Lovecraft's own poor self-esteem and his concept of himself being monstrous he put into his works uh, to make the human race. He extroverted his own thoughts onto all of humanity to, to make the entire human species into something worthless and valueless. Obviously, nowadays, if he could be diagnosed, he would almost certainly have some kind of depression, social anxiety, uh, maybe some sort of body image issues. He actually wasn't that bad looking a guy. He had a sort of a lantern jaw, blonde hair. He wasn't bad looking, at least I thought. But he had this certainty about his own horribleness that prevented him from really interacting with others on a personal level. His stories are not necessarily as important individually as the mythos, as it's called, that they crafted. He created a world that's referred to as the Cthulhu Mythos, in which humanity is a miserable, insignificant speck in the universe compared to the monstrous alien beings, demigods, and gods that are uniformly not only evil, but virtually never even consider human beings as being valuable or useful 
in any remote sense. They are human beings are pathetic pawns, not, not even pawns, ants in the cosmic scheme of things. There are things in the universe billions of years older than either of our races. They are vast, timeless. And if they are aware of us at all, it is as little more than ants. And we have as much chance of communicating with them as an ant has with us. And these monstrous gods that he created in imitation of a Victorian author named Lord Dunsany are, uh, have these evil names like Shub Nagoroth, Yag Sothoth, and of course uh, Azatoth, and um, our friend here, this adorable little dark god, Cthulhu, who is uh, sort of a squid dragon hybrid that uh, lives on Earth. Uh, and is sort of in a deathless state, suspended animation, until his evil cultists are driven insane enough to bring him back to life. And, um, you know, these, these stories of his are truly remarkable. And they craft an image in your mind of a world where there's a lingering sense of terror, sort of like an evil backbeat of this sinister synthesizer that you would hear in a horror movie, constantly pulsing on as a character walks unknowingly through darkness until they encounter some sort of monstrous creature. And he crafts very beautifully this uh, sense of dread and terror that really almost never goes away. Now, uh, Lovecraft was an unusual individual, as I said. Uh, he actually had a lifelong passion for science, and there's a considerable amount of affectation in his writing of being an objective scientific observer in sort of the late 18th, early 19th century gentleman naturalist way. He, he was so old-fashioned that uh, he really didn't seem to belong in many ways in the early 20th century, he felt more that he was at home maybe in the middle 1700s or, or perhaps even earlier. There's a look to Lovecraft that was remarked upon, I believe by Neil Gaiman, as puritanical. And he is truly a puritanical person, someone who is staring, glowering down at you, judging you very, very harshly and cruelly, and also the world and reminding you of its severity. His writing will often contain digressions and sort of almost scientific-esque writing, or something that you might find a novice trying to regurgitate something that he read in a scientific journal, which uh, apparently Lovecraft was very fond of, but he wasn't really a very talented uh, mathematician enough to become a great uh, astronomer, which is what he wanted to do, or perhaps a physicist or chemist, and he sort of was uh, forced into this role of being fascinated and in love with this idea, but not really able to exist in that way. And uh, it has to be mentioned, of course, that H.P. Lovecraft was also a racist, and not just because he was in writing in the 1920s and 30s, but even by the standards of the time, he was a pretty severe racist. Uh, his racism seems to have been tempered by the middle 1930s, uh, and he did eventually uh, marry a Jewish woman despite his uh, considerable anti-Semitism, but he was still... Uh, his, his entire work is infected with the virus of race hatred, not just in the casually uh, racist things he may say about anyone that is not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, and there's a heck of a lot of that, by the way. But um, just in general, the tenor of the story is extremely xenophobic. And that's why it's, it's very strange seeing someone adapt the work in the, modern, uh, in the modern idiom that is so passionately against hatred and xenophobia, because fear of the unknown, famously, is what Lovecraft wrote about. He was afraid of what he didn't understand, something that was different was a source of terror, and without that, you can't really adapt this work appropriately. And uh, in many ways, Lovecraft's work has defied adaptation uh, in a direct sense, and very rarely and occasionally has it been done well. In fact, I can't off the top of my head think of something that it's been adapted appropriately uh, from the source material. There was a few years ago, 
a silent movie version of The Call of Cthulhu that was made that was pretty good, but typically they lack something when someone tries to make a Cthulhu-esque story. I think, honestly, David Lynch, uh, one of my favorite directors, might be a, a good person to adapt something from Lovecraft because he would infuse everything that's going on in it with this air of sort of terror. Uh, Lovecraft was a person, he was a great horror writer and made people afraid because I think in many ways he was afraid a lot of the time. He was in a state of terror and anxiety about things, and he intimately understood it in such a way that I don't know if he even perceived the rest of the world as operating in any other way. He lived his entire life in a state, a sort of, uh, of some level of terror, I think, of something uh, imagined or real threats, and uh, he infused every bit of his work with that. Uh, fortunately, Lovecraft has been adapted in many ways in essence, not directly adapted, but the concepts of what he was doing have been taken and put on the screen in many ways, uh, starting in the 1970s with uh, Ridley Scott's Alien, which was described, and at first it doesn't seem necessarily Lovecraftian, you don't see Cthulhu running around there, but the idea of an ancient alien species that created some sort of monster was remarked upon by Stephen King and others at the time, I think Roger Ebert might have said it too, as being very uh, Lovecraftian in its form of finding this shapeless, monstrous creature that was constantly uh, violating and destroying humanity and was totally unrecognizable in any way as human. He, you know, Lovecraft was taking this xenophobia, this fear of what he didn't know, of, of something strange, and, and putting it into these types of stories, and I think it was also adapted beautifully in John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, now, of course, that movie was adapted from a science fiction work of the early 1950s, but it also feels very Lovecraftian and, and, re and related to one of his most famous stories, At the Mountains of Madness. That story uh, tells the tale of a number of scientists that go exploring in the Antarctic continent and find a vast ruined civilization and the monstrous creatures uh, that are living there. And I think conceptually, whether it's a direct adaptation or not, the DNA of Cthulhu is flowing through all of modern horror. This a sense of the, this very modern or postmodern sense of the uh, patheticness of humankind has become much more common in an era that is abandoning religion more and more and seeing just how much of a, a speck of dust we are in the grand cosmic scheme of things. And uh, in many ways, I think that Lovecraft prefigured existentialism, even though that was also uh, being worked out in the 1920s by Jean-Paul Sartre. You know, do we have any meaning in a world where, as Nietzsche said, God is dead, and we have to define things on our own? And maybe, you know, it, it's better off in an atheistic world, because in the Cthulhu world, the gods are real, and they are evil, totally an alien. And, uh, you know, I would highly recommend anyone with even a passing interest of horror reading at least one of Lovecraft's work, at least The Call of Cthulhu, but my probably my favorite work of his is The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Uh, but At the Mountains of Madness are also excellent. Another work that uh, Lovecraft did, The Color Out of Space, which was published, I think, in the 1930s, um, if it was published at all, some of his work was never published in his lifetime. It actually resembles in many ways science fiction work from the 1950s. There's a very uh, spooky 50s-ish kind of feel with it 15 years earlier than it should have appeared about this alien creature that appears in a farmland and people have to go investigate it. However, there's a little bit of a problem with reading Lovecraft. I mean, it's widely available, and it's, it's in every bookstore, every library. You can get free copies of it online. But there's an issue. As Neil Gaiman put it... Like, um, over the eldritch town of Dulwich, the gibbous moon hung illuminating the squamous and Betrachian inhabitants. So what he's saying there is just that... Um, you know, the moon was nearly full over the weird town of Dulwich and everybody who lived there was bloody peculiar frogs.
yeah, Lovecraft is really not a great author. I'm going to read uh, something of his just so you can get a sort of a semblance of his work and why it can be very trying to get through. Suddenly, a bulky white shape loomed up ahead of us and we flashed on the second torch. It is odd how wholly this new quest had turned our minds from earlier fears of what might lurk near. Those other ones, having left their supplies in the great circular place, must have planned to return after their scouting trip toward or into the abyss. Yet we had now discarded all caution concerning them as completely as if they had never existed. This white, waddling thing was fully six feet high, yet we seemed to realize at once that it was not one of those others. They were larger and dark, and according to the sculptures their motion over land surfaces was a swift, assured matter, despite the queerness of their seaboard tentacle equipment. But to say that the white thing did not profoundly frighten us would be vain. We were indeed clutched for an instant by a primitive dread, almost sharper than the worst of our reasoned fears regarding those others. Then came a flash of anticlimax as the white shape sidled into a lateral archway, to our left to join two others of its kind which had summoned it in raucous tones, for it was only a penguin. Albeit of a huge, unknown species, larger than the greatest of the known king penguins, and monstrous in its combined albinism and virtual eyelessness. So, uh, yeah, if, if you didn't quite grasp that, he spent, like, a giant, very verbose paragraph giving us a jump scare, maybe, about them thinking they were going to see a monstrous elder god or one of its servants, but it turns out to be a giant basketball player-sized penguin that was over six feet tall. Yeah, and you're going to get a lot of this. He makes weird digressions about architecture. That was one of his pet interests. He liked looking at old New England architecture and could describe it in aching detail, pointlessly. Everything about what he's doing is sort of leading you up the garden path, you know? It's taking you on this journey down into something that really doesn't necessarily go anywhere, aside from he's saying there's a dark, evil shape ahead of you, and it's vaguely described, but not perfectly there. Which is why I think that he has inspired a titanic amount of artwork over the years from professionals and amateurs alike. Just look at DeviantArt or Twitter or anywhere, you can see tons and tons of people drawing Cthulhu because he gives you just enough material to work with and then lets you expand on it yourself. Which brings me to the point overall of this video. There's actually another way, isn't that right Cthulhu? Another way for you to experience H.P. Lovecraft and his world, and that is with the Call of Cthulhu RPG system by Chaosium. You think we should take a look at this, Cthulhu? I wish doom and suffering on their pathetic race, mortal. The Call of Cthulhu role-playing game was originally published back in the early 1980s. This is the sixth edition, which was from the mid-2000s, and this is really the only one that I've actually played, although I have read uh, some of the earlier ones, although uh, it has since uh, moved beyond the sixth edition, so I don't really know what's happening with it now. But whatever edition you get, a role-playing experience in the Lovecraftian setting is one of the best role-playing experiences I've ever had. Now, admittedly, Planescape in the Dungeons & Dragons setting is my absolute favorite RPG setting ever, but uh, a second, a very close second to that, is this right here, Call of Cthulhu. And this book gives you so much cool stuff to check out inside in these pages. Uh, at the beginning, you actually get to have the Call of Cthulhu story that you can read just to get some background about the idea of uh, what you're getting into. Although it is, I think, very much recommended that you read several uh, Cthulhu stories before you go into this. Uh, you get a, a role-playing system that is, I think, much simpler it was based on an old RPG system from the late 1970s that I think is defunct now, called Basic Role-Playing, I think. And uh, it is, it, it's a little bit easier, I think, than Dungeons & Dragons, and a little bit less um, uh, math-heavy than, than that game sometimes can be. Although, um, you still do have to have die and roll things and things like that, but 
uh, it's just a little bit easier to get into. Uh, there was an amazing section in this book here where they give you background about Lovecraft's life and his career. They talk about the Necronomicon as if it was an actual book and give a scholarly dissertation about what it is and the various supposed translations of the Necronomicon that have appeared uh, over the years in various languages. There's an amazing section that gives a timeline of all of the events of the Cthulhu mythos going back literally billions of years to uh, when the various races first came to Earth. There was a, one of the best bestiary uh, sections of the game, if you can call it that, where they go through all the various gods and life forms in the Cthulhu world and mythos. So you get to learn about uh, Yog sothoth and Azatoth and all the weird little creatures, this there's a ton of amazing illustrations in this book of the various monsters and creatures, and there are uh, dozens of spells that you can learn uh, if you want to practice magic, although practicing magic is like pretty much everything with Call of Cthulhu very different than what you'd normally experience. Uh, there is combat in Call of Cthulhu. However, typically combat is something that you're really going to want to avoid. Uh, if you can help it. But really, you don't want to get to that point, especially if you're going to fight against one of the bigger creatures, like a uh, the great race of Yith, or even Cthulhu himself. You could never truly defeat them. You can only just barely stave off having them wreak any of the horrible, nightmarish violence that they're planning on uh, unleashing upon the Earth. And of course, you can't even come near something like Azatoth, which is maybe the most powerful thing in all of existence. You could never even conceive of fighting. Even Cthulhu couldn't fight that. He's, he's just too powerful. So you have to come up with creative ways to stop the human cultists usually from dealing horrible damage to the world with their insane practices. And that's pretty much what you have to do in Call of Cthulhu. You take on the role not of an adventurer like you would in D&D or Pathfinder, but of an investigator. And what you're trying to do is solve a mystery. And you have to read ancient books and talk to people and explore ruins and towns and a lot of things that you would do in D&D, but it feels more like you're solving a mystery in this game than going on a medieval quest. Now, the game could be set in the modern era. It could also be set, however, in the 1920s, 30s era when these works were, uh, when the Cthulhu mythos was originally conceived, and that's typically where I've played. I've never actually played this game uh, in the modern setting, although there are rules for it in here. I've only really played it in the uh, the 1920s era Cthulhu, where it really feels more appropriate. There, there's also some rules in here for playing Cthulhu in the late 1800s in the Victorian era, but there's a specific subset of uh, games called Cthulhu by Gaslight that you should probably get uh, instead of this if you want to do that, and that's a lot of fun too. And uh, I think that era really just fits perfectly in with the uh, the world of these amateur archaeologists and investigators that are going to the far corners of the earth, or maybe just exploring around the woods of New England to find all of these monstrous entities. And there's a bunch of things listing various alien technologies, like these these giant steel jars that you can preserve a human head inside indefinitely, but if you're preserved in that way, you go irrevocably insane because of so horrible an experience. There are also electric guns, machines that can cause earthquakes. There's just so much depth, and they really craft a world. I mean, you know, you could have a cat climb on your chair when you're trying to do a YouTube video. I mean, anything could happen in this, in this game series. A major experience in the Call of Cthulhu setting is Insanity. Now, for those of you who've played Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem on the Nintendo GameCube, you may be familiar with this system where your character can go progressively insane. And they've tried this system with a few other games. In Dungeons & Dragons, you will gradually become a demigod at the end of your journey. But in the Cthulhu world, you'll be lucky if you complete the game alive. Corvus, why? But in the Cthulhu game, you'll be lucky if you complete the game alive with your sanity intact, because coming into contact with any of the strange things in this world drives your character progressively insane, and you actually have insanity points that can build up, and if too many of them build up, your character is irre irretrievably nuts.
and they can't, you know, they're effectively dead, they can't continue on. Uh, which is why using magic is such a confusing and difficult process, because using that is a major cause of sanity loss. So you can become very powerful using spells, but typically you don't want to do it unless you absolutely have to, because it'll make your character nuts, and you can essentially lose that character to the twisted madness of the outer world. And they list all the different types of insanity your character could have. Depression, manic depression, obsessive-compulsive disorder, various phobias that they list. There's an entire page full of them, like fear of spiders, fear of snakes, fear of men, fear of women, fear of children, fear of teeth, fear of eating. And they just, you know, the list goes on and on. And it's just such a remarkable... Uh, world. You just don't really know what you're going to find in the Cthulhu Mythos, and it's just a dream for the Game Master, because you can craft a story that begins in Rhode Island and ends in the South Pacific or in Antarctica, and you could try to find an international cult of monstrosities that are trying to summon the uh, the great old one Azatoth into this world. So. If you're interested in role-playing games, or in horror, or anything, or just want to do something spooky around the Halloween season, I highly recommend getting this Call of Cthulhu book by Chaosium. As I said, there are a number of different editions. Even if you're totally unfamiliar with the world, it's, it, it, it has a great primer that really gets you into the, the mood and the feel of it. The games in Call of Cthulhu, at least the ones that I've played, tend to be some of the best horror experiences I've ever had, because it involves other people, a group that you're getting into, mysterious deaths, and the back and forth of different party members trying to determine how best to stay alive and t stay sane uh, while taking care of a threat that could potentially uh, destroy the entire world. And, you know, f there, there's something special about fighting against monsters that are basically indestructible. You know, evil, as uh, Professor Snape once said, is headless, invincible, and completely, and protean. It changes all the time, and you can't ever truly defeat evil. And, uh, you know, no matter how, how hard you try, you really get the sense that you're delving into the depths, going into, you know, pulling up a rock and seeing all the dark, nasty, squirmy insects underneath, underneath everything in our society, lurking in its corners. It's this is just a great way to get into Lovecraft, you know, especially because, as I said, he's not exactly the best writer in the world, and his work can be somewhat trying and difficult to get through. It's kind of a slog at times. He was, as I said, uh, never formally educated as a writer in, in university, so he doesn't really, he didn't go through that standard template of having his work judged by a professor, although he did uh, write voluminous correspondence to his friends and they gave feedback on what he wrote, but it's still very, uh, very dense kind of writing that can be difficult to parse at times, and going through a game in an RPG world might actually be the better way to experience it. So please let me know in the comments below if you've ever played Call of Cthulhu or if you know about Lovecraft and you've never heard of this game before. Uh, you know, would you be interested in playing Call of Cthulhu, or what your experiences have been with the game? Because I've had nothing but great experiences with this. I haven't actually played a game in quite a while, but because it's the Halloween season, I've kind of been thinking about this and reading this amazing book. And there's, a, you know, a huge collection of these Call of Cthulhu books that, that, that you can go through with all kinds of amazing adventures and wondrous characters, and I think I've never truly been connected to a character before like I have been in Call of Cthulhu, because they feel more like real people with comprehensible goals and attitudes and beliefs, unlike a lot of different more um, heroic demigod-like adventurers that you tend to play in other worlds. These feel much more down-to-earth and much more naked and... Um, unequipped really to fight against these monstrous entities and you know it's you know you start this how, how do you defeat something that is invincible you know that's a great hook to get started with this so please let me know what you think of this uh, world in the comments below. There's a lot of really good illustrations in here, by the way, that are just fantastic to uh, to peruse. And, uh, you know, my name is Michael. Uh, this is the Dark Lord of Chaos and, and Madness, uh, Cthulhu, uh, who will one day enslave or destroy all of humanity. Um, and, uh, yeah, please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. And, yeah, thank you very much, and have a doomed and insanity-riddled Halloween.
Hail the dead.